as many of you know, if you go to an old church, there's these, these stained glass windows that are magnificent, right? They're beautiful. They take years to perfect and uh, get the skill to build them, and they take tons of maintenance. Like, I didn't realize this, but if you don't maintain these things, they get pretty dirty and grimy pretty quickly. You look at Trinity in the city, and they have people that look after them, like, regularly. What happens is they get covered in grime, and actually the, the lead between the paint, as the building expands and contracts a bit, the lead will start to crack, and pretty quickly, the, the glass will start to fall out. And these, these stained glass windows often tell wonderful stories, right? There'll be the story of Jesus at the well, or you know, Mary and the, the baby. Uh, but if, if the cracks get too bad, the story gets compromised. I think in a similar fashion, in this passage this morning that we're looking at, uh, our Christian witness can be undermined when we, uh, when we don't act according to what he's called us to act. It shows the world, like in a similar fashion, the Christian witness tells the story of what God has done in our lives, and it shows what God can do with broken people. So this morning, Paul is going to challenge us to consider how disputes in the church can mar the Christian witness. It will cause to evaluate how we handle our inbuilt sense of justice, that sense that if someone does wrong to me, it's my job to right that wrong, right? He's going to show us that as believers, it's, we're called to put off our old self, which is marked by sin, by vice, vice, deception, by greed, and to put on our new self, which is marked by grace and mercy, driven by our hope in the new creation. We're looking at three different callings that God has on the Christian life. There's a call to justice, that's the first call. There's a call to witness faithfully in an unjust world. And there's a call to live in life of the perfectly just world that is to come. Let's read the whole passage and then we'll dive in and see what Paul has for us this morning. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter six. We're gonna be starting at verse one. Starting at verse one. When one one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Let's pray and see what God has for us. Lord, we thank you for calling us together this morning. We thank you that you have made us into a body of believers, family members. Lord, we pray that as we interact with your word this morning, you would challenge us to live up to the witness, the calling you have on our lives to witness faithfully. Help us put aside our pride and our deceitfulness and our, um, yeah, our desire to get one up on each other. Help us live lives full of forgiveness and grace and righteousness. Help us model the church which will be in the new kingdom. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you look at verse 1, let's look at verse 1. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he get, dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? What seems to have happened in the Corinthian church is that at least two believers have got into a dispute. One of them may have 
you know, built something and it wasn't up to code, or uh, there was probably no code in the first century, but something's gone wrong. But what they haven't done is resolved it. They haven't, you know, one hasn't gone to the other and resolved it personally. Instead, they've gone to these local courts, and courts weren't quite like they are today. Um, but Paul's not happy with them. He's, he almost makes fun of them in this verse, if you, if you look at it. There's, he's almost saying, are you so stubborn and so foolish, so daring, as to prefer the civil courts over the justice you can find within the church. A.C. Mitchell and Bruce Winters are two historians and they've written extensively about what the nature of courts were in that time. They were a bit of a spectacle, especially minor civil courts. Uh, So judges would be appointed from among wealthy families and they were much less formal. People would just come to the marketplace and they would sit before this guy and it would be just in the open market. It would be a very public affair. And they were known to be very harsh. They were a real spectacle. People would air their dirty laundry. There'd be character attacks. There'd be sensationalism. It's like Jerry Springer or Judge Judy, that sort of, that sort of thing. It was a public, you know, people would go there for fun. But what would happen is that this would exacerbate divisions realistically, wouldn't it? Like two people rock up where they hate each other. They're going to hate each other so much more after the court case than after it's resolved by a judge. I think a modern example of this was the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp trial. I don't know if any of you watched that, but I was busy procrastinating my exams when that was on. And it's it's a tragic story, but... uh, So Amber Heard accused Johnny Depp of domestic abuse, which is obviously unacceptable, obviously bad. Johnny Depp goes, no, she's the one that was the domestic abuser and she's defamed me and cost me tons of money because um, he cost him some roles. But what that case was, was just this unloading of every possible awful thing about each other, every troubled instance, all the vindictive things that could be said, they just threw them at each other for six weeks straight. And it was just this public spectacle that, you know, clips of this trial have been played hundreds of millions of times across YouTube. Everyone has seen the worst parts of their life. In Corinth, it was similar, it was this spectacle. People would air all the dirty laundry. But not only were they a spectacle, they were also considered very unjust, even by the locals. Um, local judges or juries handling these cases could be pretty easily assist, um, influenced. So these weren't fair judgments at all. Basically, if you were rich, you could get a pretty favorable judgment. Or if you were in one of the wisdom camps, if you followed a particular, um, as we discussed in chapter one, these wisdom camps of particular uh, rhetoricians you could follow, If you followed one camp and the judge happened to be of that camp, you were pretty much guaranteed to get a judgment in your favor. So Thistleton, who's a New Testament scholar, argues that Christians in this case were bringing their grievances before the court and using every aspect of the legal field to their advantage. They were hiring the best lawyers, they were bribing the judges, and they were wearing all the dirty laundry of the other individuals. So there's no justice here in the court case. So where does Paul send the litigants? He sends them to the saints. But who are these saints? Let's let's get our terminology straight here. Is it like the Mother Teresa's? Is it the Saint Assisi's or the Aquinas's of the world? The the people with perfect judgment who are incredibly wise, almost sinless. No, it's, it's look at chapter one, verse one, to the saints. It's the local church. He sends them to the godly men and women who are perfectly capable of disputing, of resolving disputes between two people with far more impartiality, far more equity, and at a fraction of the cost. But what makes these saints qualified? None of them are particularly wealthy. They don't have the social connections of the judges at the local market. They probably didn't have much legal training. What makes them qualified is that they have an eschatological hope as their foundation Look at verses two and three. Well, do, you know that, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more then pertaining matters pertaining to this life? Repeatedly throughout this letter, Paul has reiterated this future hope that Christians have, and he uses this future hope as a motivator for present action. In chapter three, we saw Paul speaking of the final judgment, where our works will be assessed. We know we're supposed to act with integrity and with purpose, 
because our present works matter for eternity. In chapter 5, a couple of weeks ago, we saw that sexual immorality in the church can't be tolerated and that like, people who are sexually immoral should be disciplined by the church because it calls them back to faith. In these passages, Paul is reminding us of the roles and the ultimate accountability that we have before God. So Paul lives us, encourages us to live with integrity, to exercise wisdom and church judgment because actions have eternal significance and souls are on the line. We see how we will judge in Matthew 19, another example of it, where Jesus said, truly I tell you, at the renew of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So what does it mean that we will judge? I don't think it's super clear. Most commentators don't seem to know exactly what that will look like. There's a lot of debate. And not all things in scripture are clear. What we do know for sure is that at the end of the age, Christ will come back and he will judge. He's going to evaluate the deeds of everyone and he's going to determine everyone's eternal destiny. So based on the Matthew 19 passage and this present passage, we know that Christians are going to be involved in this process somehow. We're going to collectively reflect Christ's perfect judgment and righteousness in this process. Same goes for angels. We don't know what it means to judge angels. They're probably judging evil angels in some capacity. But what this passage does make really clear is that we will judge the world and we'll judge demons, but those, these, both of these things are of orders, of, like, orders of magnitude of greater significance than the temporal things of this world. So we're going to judge cosmic things. Don't you think we can judge temporary things? He emphasizes this point in verse 4. So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? That could also be rendered before those who are unjust. There's plenty of good judges amongst you. There's justice in the church, true justice. There are some challenges here, right? I think questions come to mind. Is this saying that Christians can never engage in litigation? As a lawyer, I say no. I don't think it's saying that, not just because it keeps bread on the table. Um, I, think, I think we will see that Christians, we'll see later in the passage, that Christians should be marked by graciousness and kindness, but that doesn't mean we just roll over and let people walk all over us. I think we see an example of this in Acts 22. Paul uses the full extent of the legal system to protect himself as a Roman citizen. I think we see from context that this passage is primarily talking about disunity among the church. We've seen this before. This is a theme that repeats itself over and over and over again throughout this letter. So yes, Christians should seek to be gracious and kind, especially to those outside of the church. And some, but sometimes, legal recourse is the only avenue, especially when not going to legal the courts actually undermines the Christian witness. Here are some examples that I could think of. There's the Hardy's case of where, if anyone knows about the asbestosis or asbestos, um, they, they got sued because they willingly and knowingly sold asbestos products to people for decades and it killed hundreds of thousands of people and they were rightly brought to court, rightly sued, and Christians were involved in that. Um, sometimes in employment contracts where employee, employers have been wildly unjust towards their employees, it's right for employees to stand up and say, this is unjust. Sometimes there's been repeated negligence by an example, because I worked in construction law, most of my examples come from that area, where builders have been negligent over and over and over again. And so sometimes it's, it's up to the Christians who might have the resources, if, you have a Christian, if you're a Christian with the resources, it might be your opportunity to actually hold this builder accountable. Or, um, so that's... that's that's a, there, there does require discernment, though. I think there's times where it's, it's hard to know what to do. Um, but I think what this, also, this passage also says is that even in situations where a lawsuit can't be avoided, Christians should strive to conduct themselves in a way that glorifies God and demonstrates his love for the world. I have seen litigants that are so mean and so vitriolic against other parties. You can, it's amazing the things people will say when money is on the line. I think as Christians, I don't think there's an excuse for being like that in a court of law or in a, in a civil litigation case. 
Is Paul saying that? Yeah, so we should never do that. That's, I think that's, that's clear. Christians should strive to be kind and generous even in the stresses of litigation. Another question that comes up, is Paul saying that churches should be the primary adjudicators between criminal matters and criminal matters? Should the church be the primary judge of crimes? I think the answer is resoundingly no. I think Romans 13 makes this super clear. If you want to turn there with me, it's a big passage, but Romans 13 verse one says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So governing authorities are established by God. It's their responsibility to administer criminal matters. I think churches have been decimated by, this, by, by getting this conflated, getting these ideas conflated, where they've thought, oh, well, we won't, we won't involve the authorities because we'll just deal with this as an internal matter. And that's left people so hurt. And there is forgiveness for those who commit criminal acts. Forgiveness from God, and if it's given, forgiveness from other church members. But that doesn't mean criminals go unpunished. It's one of the fundamental roles of governments to punish evildoers. But with respect to civil matters, Christians should strive at all costs to be kind and generous. I hope there's no legal battles going on between members here at City Light, Plimpton, Glenelg. If there are, I think the elders would love to know about it. Um, but what, what Paul's doing here is, is he's not necessarily addressing the, church, the, the issues right here in the church right now, but he's giving us a preparatory framework for dealing with issues when they arise. They will arise. Some of you are tradies, you'll build a house, you'll work on construction, you'll be a sparky, something will go wrong. Or, this is a real case, someone will borrow some Tupperware, stain it with pasta sauce. That went to court. <laughs> It's critical that we have a biblical framework to work through these issues. Because it's, it's not just equity at stake, though. It's not just Paul worrying about who gets the rough end of the stick. His big problem is that it's damaging to our Christian witness. It's compromising Christians' ability to, to evangelize in the city of Corinth. So that comes to our second calling on the believer. The call to live lives that demonstrate the love and the unity that comes from a whole life transformed by Christ. Look at verses five through seven. I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. The goal of any legal dispute is to win, typically, right? It's to be proven right and have a judgment that says, I'm right, you're wrong. But Paul's saying it's already too late. It doesn't matter what the judge says, you're both wrong, you've both lost, and the church has suffered because of it. The defeat happened the moment the lawsuit started because it showed that the church had failed to handle the conflict in a way that a healthy family should. Garland points out that lawsuits inevitably create hostility and deepen divisions within the church. Members connected to one party would feel that they need to defend their, their friend or their patron against the claims of another party. This worsens the church's factionalism, which is, we've been discussing. In fact, Paul would argue that even a Christian court of arbitration, so that's getting someone in the church to sort of make a decision between two believers, that's already a concession. Look at Matthew 18, which says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That applies to women too. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother or sister. 
If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So Jesus has established this framework of talking about things privately, and then if, it doesn't, if that's not resolvable, taking it to witnesses, then to the elders. Should never have got as far as the cause, much less the spectacle of the, t- the temple, no, the, the um, marketplace. What message does this send to the people of Corinth? These Christians who claim to be all about grace and reconciliation and justice and kindness and forgiveness, they're no different to us. They still air their dirty laundry. They're still backbiting and scamming each other. They're hypocrites. So Paul's concern is, not, is that and is not about going through the church then we won't get an equitable result. It's that there's something far greater at stake than their rights. Their gospel witness in this wildly crazy city of Corinth is at risk. It's that there's, what, like, look at verse 7. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? It's better to endure the loss than to compromise the testimony of the gospel. Paul is pleading with this guy, get your priorities in check. Our witness, our commitment to showing the love and the kindness and the forgiveness of God should take priority over our rights, over our money, over our whole lives. I've I've personally been involved in one case where one Christian was suing another Christian and it has a tremendous impact on our gospel witness. I can tell you this from personal experience. My boss, who no longer identifies as a Christian, truly thought these people were a joke. Like he knew the, he knew the verses about why they should, how they should resolve it, but they were suing each other and he was underwhelmed. I think this is a challenging word for us. I think we, we love justice, as, especially as Australians. We love to see the good guy win. We love to feel like we've been given a fair go. How many political campaigns rely on that very principle of a fair go? I think it was like Gillard, Rudd, Malcolm Turnbull. They all had a fair go in their political campaign. So what's surprising about this passage is that Paul is going after both parties. Like, why not suffer the wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Isn't it better to lose out on the investment Better to be left looking like a chump. Better to be out of pocket than to compromise your gospel witness. Than to have the church marked by disunity and malcontent. Sorry. Take note though, Paul isn't just asking this guy to roll over and give up. He's saying that this guy should have taken advantage. This guy shouldn't have taken advantage of him. He shouldn't have defrauded him. Shouldn't have gone without repercussions. But he does direct him to the church. But even if there were no legal avenues in the church, he's saying that it's better to have lost out. It's better to be defrauded. It's better to have been scammed than to be, better to be taken advantage of than, than to forfeit his gospel witness. When we get caught up in the pursuit of personal rights, we tend to buckle down and become defensive, confrontational, self-centered. I've seen this countless times with clients. A client will come in looking for legal, legal recourse, and they will say something to the effect of, I don't care how much it costs, I want him to pay, it's the principle of the thing. As a little anecdote, it's not really relevant, but it's amazing how many people will come in and say, it's the principle of the thing, but then you lay out how much it costs to take someone to court, and principles all of a sudden have a monetary cap. Um, in any case, Paul's turning this mindset on his head, this idea of, it's justice, it's the right thing, got to get him... His, his, his values. He's prioritizing humility and self sacrifice. Do you think Paul's expectation is fair or reasonable? He is asking a lot. He's asking us to give up money, our rights. But I think it is. I think it mirrors the divine grace that transcended justice when Christ surrendered his rights on the cross. God chose to surpass mere justice. It would have been just and right for him to condemn us. It would have been justice served. One of the most powerful passages on this is Ephesians 2, where we see that God owed us wrath, but he gave us mercy. Paul himself exemplified this 
when he, um, when he talks about forsaking his rights in chapter nine, he worked tirelessly for the Corinthian church day and, day and night, working hard, uh, and he said he was entitled to payment because of it. You know, you guys owe me. I've worked really, really hard. But he says he forsook that because it would undermine his gospel witness. He would say, well, I don't want you guys thinking I'm here for the money. I'm here because I love you and I want to serve you. And so I'm going to give away my right to be paid. So Paul is asking the injured right, uh, injured party to prioritize their gospel witness over and above their right to restitution. It's our calling as believers to do the same thing. We must be willing to demonstrate the mercy and the kindness that Christ has shown us. What a brilliant witness it would have been if the guy who had been defrauded forgave the other party. We see this occasionally in court, right? We always see these clips of a Christian mother or father forgiving a murderer in court of their son. The murderer is still punished, rightly so, but what a witness it is to the Christian forgiveness that we have. But Paul doesn't let the other party off scot-free. In verse eight, he goes after the offending party. But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. He's saying, what are you doing? You're supposed to be united. You're a family supporting one another, but you're out here scamming your brother. You're undermining the gospel witness even more, if anything. I think this calls us to our third calling, the call to live a holy and sanctified life, unmarked by the tarnishes of sin. Look at verse nine through 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous cannot inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. This is the third time in this section that Paul asks this question, do you not know? What they should have known in this instance is that wrongdoers cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Remember what you used to be? You were marked by this list of vices and sins. But how are these two things connected? It seems a bit disconnected. But how are the like, court cases and a life of debauchery, what's he, what's he saying here? He's making a distinction between unbelievers and believers. Unbelievers will not inherit the kingdom of God. And these disputes are the marks of the unrighteous. By taking your disputes to court, you're acting unrighteously. You're mirroring the behavior of those who do not inherit the kingdom of God. Your actions are indistinguishable from the secular world. Instead of living out your new identity in Christ, you're reverting back to your old ways. And if they continue to do so, they're going to reveal themselves what they are, unbelievers. This is a real threat. You've been greedy. You're extorting your own brother. Paul's calling them back to their hope. Unbelievers are marked by sin and vice, and they won't inherit the kingdom. But believers will, and believers will be marked by a complete and foundational change in their identity and conduct. Once again, Paul roots his motivation for action in the future eschatological hope and in the transformative change of the gospel. We have a future hope. Those who do live according to the wonderful mercy of Christ will inherit the kingdom of God. Think about how significant a building contract or a piece of Tupperware or an investment property or a property dispute is in comparison to the kingdom of God we have waiting for us as our inheritance. How much easier is it to forgive someone who sinned against you when we remember what we have already in Christ? This hope reinforces our call to live lives that reflect the values of God's kingdom. Lives that are a foretaste of the coming kingdom. There's an anticipation of eternal life and a desire to honor God that drives us to pursue holiness, to forsake sin and embody the characteristics of the new creation. There will be no lawsuits in heaven. Thank goodness. This is a forward-looking perspective that ensures that our present actions align with our future inheritance. We want to be living as if we're in the new creation. That's the goal of the Christian, is to mimic what will be to come, where we're not marked by disunity, but by perfect 
unity forever, marked by love and faithfulness to each other. This is fundamental to our very being. Fortunately, Paul does believe he's talking to believers in Corinth. He says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You who are saved, you're called to a life that reflects your salvation. Other passages hit on this. Romans 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Colossians 3 also gives us some insight. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. We're not to conform to the patterns of this world. Both parties were conforming. One was defrauding, being greedy, scamming. The victim was being prideful and not sacrificial. Believers are called to live lives that reflect the work that God has done in us. It's to demonstrate the life-changing effects of the gospel and to show the world what it means to be part of God's covenant people, marked by forgiveness. If they were forgiving each other over lawsuits, that would have been brilliant. So my challenge to you this morning is to assess, are you living up to your calling as a believer? Most of you aren't suing each other, thank God for that, but conflict will arise. No no church is without conflict, I think that won't come as a surprise to any of you. We still sin, we're sometimes foolish, we definitely make bad decisions, but we need a godly framework to work through these issues. If and when a brother or sister sins against you, talk with them in humility, in kindness, in grace. Confront their sin, don't let it go untested. And if they don't listen, talk to an elder, get the church involved. We need to be careful with our, care, with our witness though. We need to assess how our actions, especially those, those that lead to disunity, undermine the message of unity we're sending to the world. Just note, Paul isn't asking us to fake it till we make it. He's not asking us to plaster on holy living over a rotten core. Too many churches and Christians have been burned out by that sort of mentality. What he is calling us to is to live in light of the future hope we have. The church should be a foretaste of God's eternal kingdom. And it's our duty as believers to show that world to the world, to what show the world what that will look like. So let's live in light of that eternal hope. Let's strive to be a community that's marked by righteous living, marked by compassion, marked by the mercy and grace, marked that is free from corruption and misdeeds. Let's let's live like that as we await Christ's eternal kingdom. Another thing we do here at City Light as a foretaste of the eternal kingdom each week is celebrate the Lord's Supper. As we gather together, we proclaim and we remember the sacrifice that Christ paid, his body given for us, his blood poured out on our account. As we drink and we eat, we anticipate our future glory. We will dine in the presence of God, a united whole body of Christ. That's what we look forward to when we eat together, this united body of Christ. If you're not a believer, we do ask that you would remain seated in obedience to scripture. But take this time to consider this moment. We celebrate because it is through Jesus' blood and mercy that we're saved. Not because we're better or more holy. It's just because he's merciful to us. And if you want to learn more about this merciful God of all ours, talk to whoever brought you or talk to Don or myself or Harold if he's around. If you are a believer, please come, eat, Drink, let's celebrate the wonderful mercies of God who's transformed us, that we may be this united body. Let's pray. Lord, we know that we are still dealing with the effects of sin, even at church. 
Lord, we know that we, we need your grace in these things. We need your mercy and your kindness to help shape us into who we can be. Lord, help us live in light of the wonderful gift of salvation you've given us, that eternal kingdom that we eagerly await. In Jesus' name, amen.